you can you can see <laughs> you can see she is indeed indispensable. Um, for, I want to thank Sarah for all of her help in planning this program, and the distinguished librarian of the Society Library is in the room right back there. Um, what a pleasure to welcome to the Society Library as we mark his 90th birthday, the distinguished poet William J. Smith. <laughs> Tonight is the 90th. It's your 90th year. <laughs> One of the most prolific men of letters in the nation, Mr. Smith is the author of more than 50 books of poetry, children's verse, literary criticism, translations and memoirs, and the editor of notable poetry anthologies. Appointed by the government on an early poet laureate of the United States, Mr. Smith has been honored by awards from the Swedish Academy, the Academy Francaise, and the Hungarian government. Uh, for uh, distinguished translations of their country's poetry. Uh, two collections have been nominated for the National Book Award, and he has been nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature. Born in Winsfield, Louisiana in 1918, Mr. Smith attended college at Washington University and Columbia University. During the Second World War, he served in the United States Navy as liaison officer on a French frigate in the Atlantic and Pacific. Uh, in 1947, he won the Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford, studying at Wadham College. Uh, fluent in French and Italian, he has taught and lectured in many places of the world. Bill Smith served in that much coveted and influential post of chairman of the writing division of the School of the Arts at Columbia University. And in addition, as poet in residence at Williams College, as well as professor emeritus of English at Holland University. In 1975, he received that ultimate American honor election to the American Academy of Arts and Letters, uh, which appointed him the uh, vice president for literature. Bill and his wife, Sonia uh, Hausman, well-known literary, is well-known in the literary world as a translator, who I'm happy to say is with us this evening. And... Uh, the Smiths spend part of each year in their Paris apartment in the 15th arrondissement. Isn't that heaven? <laughs> and part of the year in Cummington, Massachusetts, which is also heaven, in their wonderful house, high on a hill, surrounded by forest, which once belonged to another important American poet, William Cullen Bryant. Critics speak of his lyrical grace, pitch-perfect rhyme, his metaphysical wit, and mastery of form. Bill Smith is a major poet whose work actually embodies the history of American poetry over the last seven decades. Speaking of his Cherokee Lottery, the, that dean of literary critics, Harold Bloom, co comments that Smith writes poetry of epic proportions. And Bill Smith had an American Indian ancestor. He is part Cherokee. Uh, the writer Paul Theroux speaks of Bill's Cherokee Lottery as the best account of that American tragedy 
the Trail of Tears as not only a great poem, but a work of history and drama. Thirty years ago, Richard Wilbur said that among our gifted and original poets, Mr. Smith is one of the very few who cannot be confused with anybody else. A collected, as we say, of Bill's verse was published by Johns Hopkins University Press in honor of his 80th birthday. And tonight, Bill will read to us some of the poems collected there. The American Poets' Corner at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine has been honored by William J. Smith's service as poet in residence, which was influential in the Poets' Corner becoming an international place of pilgrimage in New York and a ceremonial gathering place for the leading American poets and writers. His successor as poet in residence is with us this evening, the fine poet Charles Martin. Charles? <laughs> well, there is so much to say about William J. Smith's life. In addition to everything else, he was urged to serve in a state legislature once, the only poet who ever did. It was Vermont. And, and now we shall hear from the poet himself how wonderful that he has returned from Paris and descended from his coming to the hideaway so that the library can celebrate his poetry and mark his 90th year <laughs> this evening. But I must read you a poem by Daniel Hoffman, who many of you have probably heard speak in this very room. Uh, Daniel uh, Hoffman, a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets and a poet laureate, introducing Bill at the Century recently. It mentions titles of some of Bill's well-known poems. Here it is. Bill, we thank you for the elegant palaver with which you gave us your peacock of Java and for closing the rodeo in plainer diction for morals and muscles, uh, uh, morals and Venice and other fictions. A, I'll do my best with this. A pour vos traductions de Corbière et de Larbeau, si bien fait que tout qui don't know. <laughs> Hope you got that. <laughs> how to read French can enjoy, uh, who don't know how to read French uh, can enjoy them. While you in moccasins tread to your rendezvous with Indians costumed as Hamlet and Lear, then among the tall ships you fearlessly steer, your pirogue filled with poems down decades on Times River, your friendship, your poems, and your joie de vivre we treasure, and the new books you've made as you enter upon your 10th decade. You give courage to all who follow your lead, and now, Bill, to celebrate you at 90 and 91, we who've come here would love to hear you read. Now, let us listen to one of America's most treasured poets, William J. Smith. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much, Lynn. And need I say that I'm only one of the many American poets who owes a very great deal to uh, Lynn Chase for what she's done for poetry. <laughs> uh, 
as uh, Lynn pointed out, I, I have, I was born in Louisiana, and I've always been very uh, attached to things French. Uh, actually, my uh, and I, I was convinced that my my own family was partly French. In fact, my mother's uh, my uh, maternal uh, grandmother's name was Faith, and I always thought it was La Foi, and that they'd come uh, to uh, to Charleston uh, many years before that. I've, I've never been uh, I've never been able to prove that. But in any case, I was in, uh, born in a little town north of what is called north of the Red River, which was called in French uh, La Côte de Joyeuse, the joyous coast, coast where the uh, French settled and uh, had a great time. Uh, so I've always felt that I belonged on La Côte de Joyeuse, uh, even though we, we made it by ox cart only to Winfield. And then I had the, the uh, op more opulent members of my family went on to Texas, and uh, we, we stopped to get salt in Winfield for the animals, but they went on and got oil later, so <laughs> I've always been left behind, but uh, I, I go on all the same, as Lynn has pointed out. I'm, I'm going to, uh, to read very much from this book, but there's one little uh, scene that my wife likes very much, and I read this now to please her, and I hope it will please you. Uh, I, I went uh, in the summer of 1938 to France for the first time, uh, and it was a great revelation for me. I spent four months there, and um, I've been uh, spending the rest of my life there or in, in so any place that's uh, related to that place. I've been to all the French colonies in the Pacific. I went on a, on a uh, on a French ship as a liaison officer, and uh, I've been uh, to Tahiti twice, uh, among my many stops. But I'm going to read this little uh, section of, the, of this book. I went to study in uh, Tours, in La, La Touraine, in the city of Tours, and uh, this is uh, of about a uh, trip outside the, uh, the city. The Loire Valley is watered by innumerable rivers, rivulets, and streams. One of the most delightful of these that winds through the valley is the River Cher, in which the Chateau of Chenonceau rests. On a gorgeous sunny day, we left the town behind us and started off through the fields that Diane knew so well. Diane is a, uh, was a medical student whom I met, and we became great friends uh, for the rest of the summer. We were soon in the midst of a world of gold and green where we passed peach orchards and wheat fields edged with Queen Anne's lace and white butterflies circling the tall grass. And we soon found ourselves at a secluded spot where the river Cher was narrow and calm and as clear and bubbly as the Vouvray we had drunk some days before. On one bank, a row of poplars stood reflected in the green water, their trunks outlined against the golden field on which the light played in the distance. On the other, a willow trailed its branches down to, to the water's edge. Beyond them, clumps of moss and cress swept out to form a kind of pale green water meadow that parted like the strands of a delicate curtain as we swam. We were not naked, but I felt as if we were, the cool water rippling over Diane's white skin in the dappled shade as she floated along in this water meadow, made her a veritable emanation of the stream, a spirit that came alive in this water world. When I touched her body in the water, it was as if I had grasped the transparent light itself rippling through my fingers and flowing with an equal transparency through my whole body. The hours that we spent wheeling, cavorting, laughing went quickly by, and the sun was beginning to set when we started back to town. Along the darkening path, we, we seemed to be still dividing the water meadow. 
When we met again that night with the other students at the Univea, that is the hotel where we went on the terrace every evening, her crystalline laughter brought back the, the enchantment of the afternoon, and when I kissed her goodnight at her pension and got back to my room, it was still with me. As I dozed off, I started a poem. Oh, I remember swimming in the Cher, light filtering down through the trees. That's as far as I got that night, but those lines would remain with me for on more than one occasion. And I do quote them in the rest of the book, which is uh, all about uh, my uh, getting to know Diane, who also invited me to see her on the coast, and then uh, uh, invited me to go home and forget about the whole thing. Uh, but uh, and so I this actually the book uh, has some photographs of her, and I don't know what happened to her in the in the end because after the war started, uh, she sent me many photographs and many letters. Uh, but I have not, never seen her since then. But I don't think she can object to what I've said in the book because it's a very beautiful picture of her. Uh, I end this uh, account of my uh, study there of uh, being going off to the Navy. And my first assignment uh, in 1942 was at, uh, in Honolulu. And then after three months there, I was sent to the island of Palmyra, which is a thousand miles southwest of Honolulu. I spent four months there, and uh, because uh, I had a, I was personnel officer of the air base. It's just a tiny little atoll. I'm going to read some poems about it in a minute. Uh, and uh, the uh, yeoman who was working for me said, "Well, you know, Mr. Smith, I know that you you are quite a linguist, and uh, I think that the Navy could uh, use you." in a better place than this, and so why don't you write to Washington and tell them about your background? And so I thought, well, this is, and he said, besides, according to Navy regulations, naval officers are supposed to do that once a year. And so I thought, well, this is a grand occasion, and so I will write, and maybe uh, uh, we'll forget about it, because they certainly will forget about it. But a month later, I got orders to, to be transferred from that little island all the way to Casablanca, uh, where <coughs> Americans had just landed. And then I went to Casablanca. I went by on a, a Liberty ship for 21 days, and we arrived in Oran, and then went through all the Atlas Mountains by train, boxcar, and uh, because it was this narrow gauge track, and it was during Ramadan. And so we had to stop every night and eat and the, because we had the Moroccan soldiers on board. And I was the only one of the Americans <coughs> who were with us who spoke French. So I would gather and the, the neighborhood would gather around uh, where we stopped. And so I know all of those little villages. I know the center of the, of the French Foreign Legion, which is Sidi Belabès. And uh, I can tell you what's there. It's absolutely nothing. <laughs> it's just du dust and dirt. Uh, but uh, I, I became fascinated by all of this. And then I went, went on to Casablanca and reported for duty. And the officer there who was in charge of the communications was the only officer who spoke French. And he said, well, what are you doing here? I didn't ask for you. So uh, anyway, he said, I can find things for you to do which he did, and then after a couple of a month, there was a ship which had fought against us in Casablanca, this frigate of which Lynn spoke, and they had to have a, a, an officer to take them uh, to, the, uh, uh, to America and to be re refitted for uh, duty in the Pacific with the, with the uh, American fleet in the Pacific. So I went on board and went back to the Pacific and I went to ev almost every island you could name, uh, the Marquesas, the, uh, uh, the uh, Numea, Tahiti, and uh, so forth. And uh, afterwards, uh, on board, I uh, started to translate from French poems. And one of the poems that I discovered was this one of uh, Paul Valéry. And I'd like to read my translation of it, Pomegranates. 
pomegranates, fruit whose rind, hard rind to rioting seed must yield, one would think that he beheld the sundered forehead of a god. If the heat that you have borne, O oh, pomegranates opened wide, has with the irritant of pride made you crack your ruby walls, and if your desiccate golden shell from pressure of some hidden force breaks in brilliant gems of juice, I, at this luminous rupture, turn my dry thought inward and discern the architecture of the soul. Ever since I uh, completed this poem, I have put a pomegranate, which my wife has usually provided for me, uh, beside me on the desk to remind me that uh, what I'm seeking in my work is to explore, as Valéry did, the architecture of the soul. And now for some poems from the, this new book, Words by the Water. The first poem is one about the island of Palmyra, Prelude. And the, uh, uh, I was very fortunate in having a friend who did a beautiful drawing of, a, uh, of an island, uh, which is here as a frontispiece of the book. Uh, it's uh, uh, Robert Andrew Parker. And uh, it shows the drawing, and, and below it, the words of Herman Melville, O oh, oh love, O oh love, these oceans vast. Prelude. All that I see must in my sight become so sparkling clear that waves of vision break upon my eye as on some coral comb, the wild Pacific. And I summon Blake to guide my thoughts beyond that curling foam, as he would lambs to pasture by a lake and leave them frolicking till kingdom come. And all that now is ill will then be well, all will then be well, and all that now is ill will then be well. This is the atoll. An island is all one can ever know, and all that can ever be though part of a vast archipelago rooted in the sea. It is all one feels, all one finds, all that the heart lays bare, an atoll formed, the waking minds open on endless air. That's minds, M-I-N-D, apostrophe S, that is the, uh, the f of the form, uh, the, it is form f f what is formed by the mind. And, of course, this is a, a turn on the famous statement of John Donne that no man is an island entire of itself. Everyone is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. And, of course, that is true, but at the same time, we're all separate. And I've thought of uh, using this uh, experience of islands as a kind of bridge which uh, art provides. And the island that I was prepared to defend was Palmyra, a coral atoll a thousand miles southwest of Honolulu and uh, 350 miles north of the equator at almost the exact center of the Pacific Ocean. The United States Navy took it over in 1940 and after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor it became an important base the first stop for planes to refuel on their way south. In May 1942, at the Battle of Midway, the U.S. Navy, uh, having broken the Japanese code, defeated the Japanese and kept them from occupying Hawaii. At that time, there were only a few hundred men stationed on Palmyra, but they managed with their five-inch gun battery to drive off an attacking Japanese submarine. I arrived shortly afterward, an, a naval communication officer, and remained for five months. It was at night on Palmyra, with water on every side, and the phosphorescent breakers of that vast ocean pounding the reef and the southern cross above on, at my fingertips, that I came to know 
the terrifying beauty of being <coughs> at what seemed then the edge of this earth. Uh, there are several poems about the uh, experience of the, of the island. I'd like to read one more of them. On his dark bed, he who has felt on his dark bed the pressure of the tides finds sunlight ebbing round his head, morning on all sides. Like all heaven, the hound will eat from his hand and the wave like a newborn foal. Manes engulfing a green island, lions court his soul. Lions that walk the yellow sand on the blood of morning fed, and he who wakes finds light his land, darkness fleeing fled. And uh, this section of the book ends with, with this poem, Reflection. No, I'm sorry, uh, Flight, it's called The Flight. Come, the captain said, let me show you how this place looks from the air. And I followed him to the monoplane, the little cat waiting at the end of the runway. We strapped ourselves in, he in front and me behind, and soon the propeller began to turn and we were off into space, leaving the atoll and its blue lagoon below. A sputtering of the engine, strong smell of oil, the constant swirl of air over our faces, and the incessant shaking of the plane, the voice of the radioman on the island, crackling through the st static, I lost all sense of time. How long had we been up? Ten minutes? Fifteen? Twenty? Forty-five? I was nodding and slipping off into another world when suddenly, loud and clear, the captain spoke to bring me back. To the radioman he said, We'd better find our way down soon because we're running out of gas. I clearly saw at once the beginning of our end. And it was then that the verses, that the voices began to reach me, faint at first and fluttering moth-like through consciousness, but gradually thickening, growing more distinct and resonant until they all got through to me, just as they had originally when they had, had come from that other plane that was trying desperately to find our island and were soon swallowed up by the sea. How long had we been up? My whole life went by in seconds, and I knew that I was ready to answer those voices rising from their deep well. I would find those who had been unable to find me. I would reach them easily now, wherever it was they had lain so long in wait. I was prepared for our end and for the clap of the cold wave and everything beyond. But first I turned aside one final time. And miracle of miracles, a bead curtain of rain cut through the air to reveal an open segment of sky, and below it an atoll and a blue lagoon. The island garden flew up to greet us, all its perfumes and water flowers encircling their face, our faces as the plane brought us back to the coral strip where great waves broke on the world's edge. And standing there at the reef's very tip, I found the mind's ever-present clear image of that sleek tropic tree, the slender fronded branch projected into eternity. Now, I'll go to a more contemporary scene and this is a poem called Willow Wood. The wood of the willow tree has long been a component of artificial legs. Now, of course, they're using many other uh, items uh, with the new, um, the, <coughs> the, the, the uh, new science. Uh, but the, uh, 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 some part is always still uh, willow wood because the willow is so light. The soldier spoke up and said, God bless the willows. On willow wood I walk, 
come with me down this lovely country lane outside of town. The soldier spoke up and spoke for the other fellows. I lost both legs, he said, in a roadside blast. They swirled off into the sand where I'd come to fight and follow them and follow me now when I awake at night and walk as in a dream far into the past and walk to the edge of my youth where weeping willows brush the cold spring water clear and sweet where I kick and swim and cut through summer heat in a burst of joy with all the other fellows. The years go by and all those willows bend and still those willows bend above the spring moss rimmed by memory and in reflection weep but not for me but for a world whose wars will never end. Then this uh, the very local scene Invitation to Ground Zero Into the smoldering ruin now go down and walk where once she walked and breathe the air she breathed that final day on the burning stair, and follow her beyond the fleeing crowds into the fire and through the climbing clouds. Into the smoldering ruin now go down and find in ashes bright as hammered tin a buried bone-white naked mannequin that flung from some shop window serves to bind her body and its beauty to your mind. Then this is my one little poem about conspiracy, contemplation of conspiracy. Where the table leg projects into the yellow autumn sunlight like the poor premise of an argument, the plotters gather rotting wood at a creek's end, tirelessly planning the devastation of the spirit, wiring the heart for a final explosion. Where can they lead you but over the bridges of beetroot into the country of spiders? Do not follow them to their camp pitched in a cranny. Bring your fist down hard on the table and send them flying. Then I'd like to uh, to read the poem that uh, Lynn mentioned, uh, Old Cherokee Woman's Song, from the Cherokee Lottery. They have taken my land, they have taken my home. They have driven me here to the edge of the water, cold as the ground and cold the red water. At night, the men come to circle the campground. They carry tall reeds, each topped with a feather, a bright eagle feather, to draw our eyes upward and bring us all hope for the bitter long journey. But for me, the reeds broken, and the sky, it has fallen, where black storm clouds gather. Cold is the ground, and cold the red water. My blood, it will mix with the flowing red water. They have taken my land. They have taken my home. I go now to die beyond the red water. Then this poem is one spoken by one of the tribe before they're moved off to the west. Song of the Dispossessed. You came across the water like gods you walked ashore. The fabric of our dreaming was the clothing that you wore. You came with ornament far brighter than the sun. You brought the handsome horse, the flashing blade, the gun. You brought your holy book that held a world entire, a life that never ended and water that was fire. You said, we'll live as brothers, as brothers we will die. We'll share the forest carpet and the blanket of the sky. But then when we came near you, you said, you move, now move away. 
You come too close now, brother. It's dangerous to stay so close to one another, and you must understand that we know what is better. We send you to a land far richer in the west, beyond the great brown river, where grass is always green, and there you will live forever. And so you took our country, you took our sacred ground, the birds and beasts we cherished, the falling water's sound, the stag that with his antlers breaks the sun-flecked trail, the mockingbird, the turkey, the heron, and the quail. You sent us to this desert, this sand, these pitted stones, where wind rakes through the gully and bears the bison's bones. Where now above this barren earth your great bald eagle screams that robbed us of our country and carried off our dreams. Now for a change of pace, I'm going to read uh, some light poems. First is uh, one about dachshunds. The very mention of it is funny, I think. Uh, dachshunds. The dachshund leads a quiet life, not far above the ground. He takes an elongated wife. They travel all around. They leave the lighted metropole, nor turn to look behind upon the headlands of the soul, the tundras of the mind. They climb together through the dusk to ask the lost and found for information on the stars not far above the ground. The dachshunds seem to journey on, and following them I take up my monocle, the moon, and gaze into the sky, pursuing them with comic art beyond a cosmic goal. I see the whole within the part, the part within the whole, see planets wheeling overhead, mysterious and slow, while morning buckles on his red and on the dark zones go. That is a very serious poem indeed. Uh, uh, now the, uh, about a small dog. An even smaller dog. Uh. So I don't seem to find anything here. Yes, here we are. This is an epitaph for a small dog. A Laza Apso that died fighting with a St. Bernard on the coast of Maine. And you know the Lazo Apso is that wonderful little dog with sort of long red hair that was, uh, was put in, in, kept in the Tibetan monasteries as a watchdog. And uh, this, uh, this actually happened to the dog of a friend of ours. Here fearless lies with Asian pride, long-haired and small by the ocean side. He took up the challenge, fought, and died. Now hear his bark in the rising tide. And uh, then a poem about cats. Cats in a summer garden. Pontifical proud sleepers in the sun, plump cats on wicker chairs with long tails curled about your full four quarters, tails that twirled when late you hunted speckled fish at heaven's edge. Your privilege expires. The workmen flock to Willow Run. The stars disperse, and gardeners commence the labors of the early morning hours, administer to lush, demanding flowers and fragrant roses, fragile roses that are far from Ispayan, with watering can and garden shears to keep the jungle hence. Up, cats, the beds are made, and I, for one, cannot delay. To live a reasoned life, promote concord where there is only strife, means work, for art is long and life is not a joke. Like factory smoke, you drift away. What is there to be done?
Now, I've written a number of, uh, of wedding songs, and I'd like to read some of those. This is a section of the book called The Greatest Wealth, and I take the, uh, the title from one of the, of the poems, which, was, which speaks of a, a wedding song as offering the greatest wealth. This one is, is one that is uh, widest known, I think, has been for years. Now, it's been set to music a number of times, once by Ned Roram and another time by Calvin Bowman of Australia. Now touch the air softly. Now touch the air softly, step gently, one, two. I'll love you till roses are robin's egg blue. I'll love you till gravel is eaten for bread and lemons are orange and lavender's red. Now touch the air softly, swing gently the broom. I'll love you till windows are all of a room and the table is laid and the table is bare and the ceiling reposes on bottomless air. I'll love you till heaven rips the stars from his coat and the moon rows away in a glass-bottomed boat and Orion steps down like a diver below and earth is ablaze and ocean aglow. So touch the air softly and swing the broom high. We will dust the gray mountains and sweep the blue sky and I'll love you as long as the furrow of the plow as however is ever and ever is now. Uh, that poem appeared in a beautiful little book uh, called The Girl in Glass with uh, some wonderful uh, woodcuts by the Hungarian Hizdovsky. Um, this was, it was published by Jeanette Watson some years ago, um, and I hope sometime it'll come back into print. Uh, th this is another wedding poem for Deborah and Mark. Song for a Country Wedding. We've come to the w in the winter to this warm country room, the family and friends of the bride and the groom, to bring them our blessing, to share in their joy, and to hope that years passing the best measures employ to protect their small clearing and their love be enduring. May the hawk that flies over these thick wooded hills, where through tangled ground cover with its cushion of quills, the plump porcupine ambles, and the deer comes to browse, while through birches and brambles clear cold water flows, protect their small clearing, and their love be enduring. May the green leaves returning to rock maples in spring catch fire, and still burning, their flaming coat fling on the lovers when sleeping, to contain the first chill of crisp autumn weather with log fires that will protect their small clearing and their love be enduring. May the air that grows colder where the glacier has left its erratic boulder mountain water has cleft and the snow then descending no less clear than their love in a white, be a white quilt depending from sheer whiteness above to protect their small clearing and their love be enduring. And then the last one of the wedding poems, and this is for my granddaughter Marissa and her husband David, who are both here tonight. The bouquet. Excuse me. The lovers whom today we praise once passed each other on some street and both then went their separate ways. Where in the world would they ever meet? They followed other brides and grooms to places they'll not soon forget and dined and danced in distant rooms and still the two had never met. But then one day a mutual friend sat them down on one divan and where my story might well end is where it really just began. <laughs> they talked and talked and then for months they were the proverbial happy pair, and had they chosen still to be, my story might have ended there. But the groom, once profiting by chance another country, better luck, pursued his would-be bride to France, and there it was that lightning struck. 
It was in Paris that he chose to, to find if she would share his life and ask in simple English prose, will you, sweetheart, be my wife? She felt deep down a tingling shock and up her spine an icy chill and in her heart a great hot flash and she responded, yes, I will. <laughs> they stood beneath the Eiffel Tower and Paris at the close of day offered at that magic hour a very special gilded spray of every shade of lighted flower which through the darkening evening air emanated from the tower and fell upon them then and there in a fabulous bouquet. And we who come to celebrate their union this wedding day offer them our deeply felt and very personal bouquet of flowers that of words are made that will not wither or decay, that worm or insect won't invade and here in print is meant to stay. I always uh, uh, agree with the poets who compliment themselves in their poems. Uh, if nobody else is going to do it, you have to do it yourself. Uh, uh, because it, when you write something that you think is good, there's no sense in the not saying that you think it is. Anyway, um, I would l end with a poem that's been very popular. Uh, it's uh, Woman at the Piano. And this is a poem that's based on a statue by the uh, artist uh, Ellie Nadelman. And it's, it's one of those um, uh, folk statues that uh, influenced his work very greatly. And that's where it's, it's partly humorous as well. When the tall, thin lady started to play, the notes flew up and off and away, like the pink in her cheeks and her dress's hoops. They r rose in curves, they rolled in hoops, till, till the chickens flew out of the chicken coops. The rooster crowed, the donkey brayed, and the cat meowed. She raised her hands and lifted her feet, what was she playing? An anthem? A hymn? Nobody knew, but oh, it was sweet. How thin she was. How tall and prim, but oh, how she played. Everything in you went loose inside. And the world of a sudden became so wide and open and joyous and free. The fish came flying out of the sea. The mountains knelt. The birds went wild. The lady smiled, and all you could do was hold on to your seat and simply say, For heaven's sake, lady, play, play. For heaven's sake, lady, play. I'm going to uh, end by reading a, a poem that's not in the book, but I brought some copies of it along, and I signed them, so I think there'll be a copy for everybody here. Uh, it uh, is a poem that might have better served as an introduction. It's a, a self-portrait called Mr. Smith. This is in one of my books. Um, it was published first in one called Mr. Smith and Other Nonsense, but now it's, uh, it's, it's called Laughing Time, a Collected Nonsense. And um, you know that Edward Lear wrote a poem uh, which began, How pleasant to know Mr. Lear, who has written such volumes of stuff. And then T.S. Eliot decided he should write his version of that, which was how unpleasant to meet Mr. Eliot with his features of clerical cut. And so I decided to do my version of it, and it's how rewarding to know Mr. Smith. If you have a name like Smith, you have to do something about it, and I did. <laughs> Everything in the poem that I say is true, but I do not say everything. <laughs> How rewarding to know, Mr. Smith, whose writings at random appear. Some think him a joy to be with, while others do not, it is clear. His eyes are somewhat oriental, his fingers are notably long, his disposition is gentle, he will jump at the sound of a gong. 
His chin is quite smooth and uncleft. His face is clean-shaven and bright. His right arm looks much like his left. His left leg, it goes with his right. <laughs> he has friends in the arts and the sciences. He knows only one talent scout. He can cope with most kitchen appliances, but in general prefers dining out. <laughs> this is before I met my French wife. When young, he collected matchboxes. He now collects notebooks and hats. He has eaten roussette, flying foxes, which are really the next thing to bats. He has never set foot on Mallorca. He has been to Tahiti twice, but will seldom, no veteran walker, take two steps when one will suffice. He abhors motor bikes and boiled cabbage, zippers he just tolerates. He is wholly indifferent to cribbage and cuts a poor figure on skates. He weeps by the side of the ocean and goes back the way that he came. He calls out his name with emotion. It returns to him always the same. It returns in the wind and he hears it while the waves make a rustle around. The dark settles down and he fears it. He fears its thin, crickety sound. He thinks more and more as time passes, rarely opens a volume on myth until mourned by the tall prairie grasses. How rewarding to know, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. How rewarding to know Mr. Smith. Thank you so Thank you. much for coming to the uh, I wanted to say that I used one of Lear's lines, he weeps by the side of the ocean, because I actually wrote this in Le Lavandou on the, on the edge of the Mediterranean, and my son David was about five years old then, and I read it to him, and he burst into tears. And I said, but I thought it was a real funny poem. What's, what's so sad about it? He said, I didn't like that part where you cut your poor finger on skates. <laughs> he cuts a poor figure on skates. He <laughs> saw me with my bloody hand. Thank you all so much for coming. We persuaded Bill to let us uh, have a few copies of his work, which are out in the hall, if someone would care to uh, have them signed by him. Um, they are for sale. And uh, also, I hope that you will join together in raising a glass to Bill Smith for all his birthdays. <laughs> and uh, celebrate with us his coming to the library. Thank you.